everybody and welcome. My name is Margaret. I'm a historical costumer and textile conservator in training. And today I have another exploration of one of my study collection pieces for you. I have a study collection of roughly, I would say, probably up to about 50 pieces now in my one bedroom apartment uh, that inform me on historical dress construction techniques and also because I'm a textile conservator, the degradation of materials and how that may be mitigated. So I've been doing kind of a series going through these. I try to do about one garment a month-ish um, and I really enjoy looking at these with you guys because I love going through my collection and it gives me an excuse to do that. So today we have a very exciting piece. This is a circa roughly probably 1905 walking suit. Uh, it's nice, but it would have been casual. This came from one of my favorite vintage stores in Minneapolis. So this is probably worn by someone in the Minneapolis St. Paul area. And it is just the perfect fall piece. It is of this beautiful colored sort of dark, I mean, it's brown. It's like a caramel orangey brown sort of pecan. I'm gonna call it pecan, pecan color. And it's just made out of this gorgeous wool. Um, it's sort of this twill weave wool with these beautiful sort of dark caramel silk ribbon accents. It's an asymmetrical cut. It does have its fair share of problems. This, was, this is not by any means a museum quality piece, but I believe it does have a lot of great things to show us. And if you are making a walking suit circa 1905, this is probably a good video to watch. So let's dive in. Uh, first, let's go into the bodice right here. This bodice, of course, made of that beautiful pecan colored wool with the silk ribbon accent here on the center front. It has a lace overlay at the yoke that had a sort of striped silk underneath it. Um, unfortunately, the striped silk is very, very shattered. This sort of taupey, um, almost kind of dusky pink, um, completely shattered out, and the lace is not in the best of condition either, um, but you can still, there's still very much remnants of it there. It has this beautiful sort of gimp trim along the bust line there, and it has this beautiful gathered situation. It would have had that billowy pigeon front silhouette we are so used to seeing in this era. The sleeves are a little bit full with this kind of peak at the end, and it has a sort of mock neck length collar. Now there's significant wear under the arms, which is to be expected um, from a garment that was worn. At this point in history, garments, these outer garments, probably wouldn't have been washed, um, maybe spot cleaned once in a while, but the idea was that you would have, you know, your corset cover and your chemise sort of shielding your sweat from coming out um, to the main garment. And although that worked quite well, garments that have been worn and used often do times have significant underarm damage from body soiling and from the friction of just, you know, moving about. So. That's typical, that's a good sign. It's been used and it's been worn. So let's open her up here. She opens with hook and eyes down the uh, proper left hand. These are period hook and eyes. As you can see, they were sewn together, just connected in a line. It has the nice flattened head, at the early 20th century, and the eyes are right there as well. And then it also hooks up at the proper left shoulder open this so you can see it also has an inner little vest um, lining vest that also hooks closed at the center front so the cool thing about this is that it has been repaired so as you can see there's a lot of stress being put on this lining layer and it was split sort of between the connection point of the turnover essentially so what they did was they put this big patch in there and sewed it up. This probably would have been done in the period and this other rip probably was done afterwards. So they did repair it and it's a nice repair. It's a period repair, which we love to see. Moving on to the interior, 
no boning on the interior. Not every single bodice had boning on the interior at this period, but a lot of them did. So this is one that doesn't have it. Um, the seams are beautifully finished. Uh, the seam allowance is turned in and then sort of blanket stitched down, which is a beautiful, beautiful touch. There is a cotton uh, waist facing at the back and the armholes are entirely bound, which is a super, super nice touch. Um, as you can see, the lining of the sleeves is a little bit different from the lining of the bodice proper. Um, and it looks like they were just using uh, what they had. They were just like, you know what? We have a bunch of, uh, you know, brown colored glazed cotton sitting around and we're just gonna use all of the different ones that we have, which is totally something that I would have done as well. You can sort of see the bust darts here, that shaping, it's that, you know, it's that corset that really cinches you in, lifts up, gives you that really sculpted torso. At this point, it's more flat in the front than in the 90s, but still super sculpted and you can see that in the lines of this bodice. Now flipping it over, we see that there is more gimp trim along the back here, along the yoke. There's a the little bit of ruching at the back. The back is cut pretty typical to a bodice of this period, but it does have this sort of extra narrow side back situation going on. I feel like this was more a piecing technique than anything else because the grain is a little bit funky, but it is an interesting situation. The sleeve is done in two pieces, a front and a back. And you can see that there. And the cuff is just lined with that same fabric. Turning over again, as you can see, we are losing chunks of that silk everywhere, which is super annoying. Um, the best thing to do for this, honestly, there is no cure for shattered silk just is how it is, um, would be to put um, a net overlay of some type over this piece just to stop the attrition of silk pieces. But there's, it's, it's pretty much a lost cause at this point. So this is gonna be approximate measure, obviously, but we are looking at 16 inches across. So that's like a 30, like a 34 inch bust, because um, there is a lot of extra room up here. So 34, 35 inch bust. And then this we're looking at about a 37 inch waist. So a lot of people think that extant garments are super small. Um, and sometimes they are. This one is about a US size four. It would fit me. Um, I find, funnily enough, a lot of antique garments are very close to my size, which is great. I love that. <laughs> because when I'm patterning um, stuff from extant garments or I'm looking at books that have extant garments in them like Janet Arnold, Nora Watt, et cetera, they tend to fit me pretty well. So if you are a 34 inch bust and a 26 inch waist corseted, you're in business. Otherwise, there are other garments that fit a range of sizes. Historical people were all different shapes and sizes just as they are today. It just seems that the garments that survive happen to be my size, which is fabulous for me and anybody else who is my size. Moving on to the skirt. This is a Victorian walking skirt and I love having full ensembles. It's a lot harder to find full ensembles. Um, you can find turn of the century bodices like this knocking around all, like all over the place. You might think that antique clothing is super, super rare. And to some extent it is, but finding a turn of the century bodice is really one of the things I tell people to start with if you're looking to start a collection because they're everywhere and you can find them for reasonable prices. I try to get most of my bodices around the $40 to $60 price point unless I'm looking at something super special like something with a really great label in it or something that's in really good condition. Otherwise, the $40 to $60 price range is what you're going to be looking at for something like this that has a significant amount of damage to it, something that is obviously not gonna be wearable under any circumstances and is purely for study. I've even found them for like $5. One time I won an eBay auction for a turn of the century bodice for 99 cents. So 
if you're looking to start a collection, turn of the century bodice is the first way to go, and then you can move on to Edwardian white work would be the next thing I would recommend. That's going up in price though, because people are actually wearing that out and about. So without further ado, let's get to this skirt. Um, it's not gonna look like much on the table, but I am gonna be able to put this on my mannequin because it is the size of my mannequin, which is great. Um, so this is your traditional Victorian walking skirt. She has one, two, three, four, five, six, eight panels, eight panel skirt. She's got this beautiful pleating in the back, closes with two hook and eyes. There's no pocket in this one. A lot of dresses around this time are starting to discard pockets in the middle of the 19th century and in the late 19th century. There's basically a pocket in every dress because if you have a huge skirt like they did in that time period, um, that really billows out from the waist and you have a lot of area around the hips, it's really easy to fit a pocket in there. But once we're getting into the Edwardian period, the hips really become a focal point of the silhouette, meaning that the skirts are really slim to the hips, meaning that you don't want a bulky pocket in there. Sometimes they are put at center back, so you will see some pockets right here, but I don't find that to be a really common thing in turn of the century garments, especially in the first decade of the 20th century. Um, this is when handbags really start to become a focal point of women's dressing. I actually have a whole video about pockets. If you wanna watch it, I'll pop it up there. It's like 40 minutes long. It's by far the most effort I've ever put into a video and I really think you should watch it because I think it's really good, um, but that's just a snippet of that. Again, aligned with the same beautiful glazed tobacco colored cotton lining. It's everywhere, folks, it's everywhere. And the seams are machine sewn, everything in this garment is machine sewn essentially with no finishing to the seam edges, which is really, really common. Skirt seams were done up super fast in almost every period. Um, so I have hand sewn gowns from the 1830s and 40s where the bodices will be stitched to perfection and the skirt will be put together in a series of long running stitches. This bodice has beautiful finishing on the raw edges, whereas the skirt has no finishing on the raw edges. So a really down and dirty flat line skirt with no finishing is really quite common in the period as well. This is, if you haven't noticed, this is a very typical dress of the period, which is always good to see. Facing on here is just the wool, it's a self-facing. And the really gorgeous thing about this piece is at the hem. So you can feel in this hem, there's a lot more weight to it. The, the actual skirt, the upper portion of the skirt is pretty lightweight. It's just the one um, layer of wool and then the one layer of lining versus the hem of this skirt has a really stiff lining in it, um, approximately six inches up from the hem. Um, you can kind of see it here. It's this really starched, peeled linen of some type. Um, so it really gives the hem a lot of flair. It lets it stick out, it lets it stand up on its own essentially. The hem is finished off um, with this beautiful brush braid fringe and then just some wool hem tape as well um, tacked to the hem, um, which is absolutely gorgeous. I love brush braid. It's something that you cannot find anymore. Um, I was able to find enough to do at least one skirt and I do wanna recreate this outfit in full, partially because it is my size, so if I take a pattern from it, it's gonna be really easy to do, but also because I have the perfect brush braid for it. Brush braid just would have been a really great way to keep the bottom of your skirt clean. You know, kind of brushes things along, it's almost like a broom, you know? Um, and it's, I think it looks so cool and it looks, it's one of those things that's really common to this period specifically. Um, versus the wool hem tape, which is common to a lot of other periods. So that is this skirt and bodice suit combination. I will pop it on the mannequin for you.
that's it for this lovely piece. If you would like to see more videos like this, I also talk about my sewing projects, a little bit about conservation, some dress history things. You can, of course, hit the subscribe button down below, like the video if you liked it, leave a comment if you have anything to say. You can also follow me over on Instagram at Costume and Conservation and TikTok at Costume and Conservation, where I put out more regular content. On this channel, I like to put out content every Saturday, but that might be changing as I am in my second year of graduate education in textile conservation. So just um, keep around for updates. I'll update you over on my Instagram as well if the schedule does in fact need to change. Otherwise, I hope you have a fantastic day. Bye!